Olivia, it's so wonderful after this Christmas season and into this new year to be able to have some time with you. So thank you for joining me in this Learn to Listen series. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. I'm really honored to be here. Wonderful. Well, I know there's people who don't know of you, and I'm so excited that they will now. You're a multifaceted artist, <laughs> really incredible creative. Um, and I know that you've had opportunities to be, we just shared about this, to be on the other side of this microphone where you're the one interviewing. So I'd love for you to share just your history and your different diversities of arts, um, how that'll fold into faith, and then we'll jump into some questions. How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, yeah, you're right. Kind of multifaceted with the arts in different ways. And I actually was always kind of torn about that in my teen years, which is kind of when I really discovered the creative arts and um, through music probably first. And we went to a pretty charismatic Lutheran church, which is unusual. <laughs> um, but just a really dynamic place that was kind of pioneering things with the arts at the time. It was the 90s. So um, they were just doing big productions and um, with the passion play and some of those things. And so that's kind of where I discovered the arts. And so I discovered it through the realm of worship. Um, even with dance too, I discovered dance through worship, which um, isn't usually the typical route. And so I just realized I really liked to sing and was doing music ministry. And then there was, we had a big musical youth choir and started doing choreography. I was never trained in choreography or anything, but I just really discovered that gift and I really loved it. And my senior year of high school, the choir director paid me. So it was the first time I'd ever gotten paid <laughs> for something dance related. Um, so I just realized like these were things God was weaving in my life and continuing to bring forth. Um, and so it was kind of a late bloomer, especially for dance. I went to college, didn't know what I wanted to do. I tried music. I didn't love classical vocal training um, and music theory. I mean, I know it's necessary, but I was like, this isn't what I want to do forever. And so the only thing I could think of that I love to do even when I even when I was exhausted that was kind of how I measured it like when I'm really tired what do I still feel like I can get up and do and it was dancing um, and so even though I was a late bloomer I decided to go for it and went to the University of Minnesota and actually majored in kinesiology and then paired it with an emphasis in dance which was a new thing it sounds crazy, but it was the kinesiology department was all like physical athletics department and didn't marry with the dance department at all. And so I had to get special permission to even declare dance as my emphasis. And my advisor was like, not really for it, but <laughs> he was in the kinesiology, you know, physical athletics department. He just knew nothing about dance. And so I was like, this is what I want to do. And so um, I don't know if that's changed at the University of Minnesota. I hope so. But that's kind of um, the route I took. So kind of feel like I came at dance at least kind of through the side door. You know, I didn't grow up dancing forever and training and, you know, all these different places. So, um, yeah, graduated from the University of Minnesota and just wanted to keep dance in my life, but had gotten married and started a family. And so eventually got open the opportunity to start teaching at a dance academy that had grown out of the church I had grew up, grew up in. So it was kind of this full circle, you know, beautiful thing God had continued to weave into my life and kept in my life. And so I brought um, the styles of modern and hip hop to this dance academy because they hadn't offered those styles yet. And um, yeah, I've been teaching there actually for the last 12-ish years, I think. Excellent. And just, it's been a great place. It's gone through a lot of ups and downs, but God has just really held it 
kind of in, you know, this protective, like under his wing in a way, and it's just really grown and thriving. And we have about 300, a little over 300 students now offer all styles. And then it's just been a place to be able to experiment help start a um, like pre-professional company out of it um, kind of gives a place for dancers who it's not their vocation but they want to keep dance in their life and keep performing and training so started that and then a conservatory program and so just some different facets within that too that I've been able to do and then on the other side with the arts um, with music, I started some songwriting a few years ago, and um, that actually came out of a painful place in music ministry that I wanted to just quit music, but God brought me to my piano and just said, sit down and sit at your piano, and these songs came out that were just prayers. Really, I wasn't going to share them with anybody, but eventually, after about a year of just praying through some of that pain and healing and God finally said I want you to share these songs now and so I ended up recording two albums over the next two years and released those into the world too so some of that and then some writing too I do some blogging and writing different articles and then the podcast which I'll talk a little bit more about kind of in one of your questions about listening great that's wonderful. Wow. I, I love hearing the diversity of all these stories and how God finds us. And some, mm -hmm. and often it is atypical. And so you're one more of those stories of not the quote unquote normal trajectory that you start dancing when you're a little girl and you're dancing your whole life and you know how that all weaves together. It's just really beautiful that he can find us whenever he desires, yeah. whatever ways he desires. Or yes. you alluded to the question. So the first question really is looking at this whole concept of knowing that God is speaking and communing and communicating with us and the importance of learning how to cultivate a listening ear and listening heart and mind. And so how do you, how do you personally um, feel like God most, I guess, prevalently speaks and communes with you or just what ways... Mm -hmm feel like you've cultivated this skill to learn to listen to to God yeah yeah I love that question um I feel like I do it in a lot of ways because I've always been more of a listener I'm not the one who needs to talk and control the room and the conversation <laughs> I'd much rather observe and listen and I've always been like that um and so yeah being a listener versus a talker but I, I have to confess, like in this digital age and, you know, this trajectory we're on with like constant noise and distraction, it's been harder and harder to listen, you know, and I think we're losing that art form and losing that skill and just that sacred space. And so I love that you're even creating a space here one-on-one -on -one to listen. Um, so I just think it's so needed. And that's one of the reasons too, I started my podcast, which I can talk about a little bit, because that I feel like has really steered me back to listening and just how valuable it is and important it is. And so that for me has been one of the big ways I've kind of cultivated that discipline of listening. And about three years ago, it was a seed God had planted in my heart to start a podcast talking about that intersection of art and faith because it was something I was talking about already just with colleagues and friends and I feel like there's always kind of been a tension there if you're an artist of faith and you know you're always feeling this conflict or this pull you know and where you fit in and what you can say and do and not do and so I'd kind of been blogging about that anyways and talking about that and God dropped the seed of the idea to start a podcast talking about it, <laughs> which is kind of funny because for some reason growing up, I always told God like no radio, yeah. no public speaking. <laughs> I don't know why. I just always said that. Like, just don't make me do that. Um, so it felt kind of crazy 
to start a podcast and I didn't know how either. This was not my forte and I don't love technical stuff and gear and editing. And (laughs) so it was a really big learning curve and it was something I felt like I could choose to listen to God saying or not, you know, and it was almost like this little adventure he was calling me to. Um, And so, yeah, I decided to listen (laughs) and um, I just did some research and just started, you know, looking up stuff on how to do this. I really was like, I did not know how to do this. And three years ago, I had no idea either how podcasting would really explode. So, um, yeah, figured it out, overcame the learning curve to a certain extent, and talked to friends, had a few help me get it launched. And I wanted to launch with like five episodes because that's kind of the advice given when you launch a podcast is kind of bundle some episodes so you get a little more traction and downloads right away um and so launched it got it all set up I think in about six weeks time did interviews edited taught myself how to do that um so it's a really good testimony to being the least qualified (laughs) or at least feeling like being the least qualified when God speak something to you I feel like you know that's usually how it is is you don't feel qualified I really wrestled with God about it and not thinking I could do that or should do that um and so yeah because it was a realm I wasn't familiar with but I'm also not like an extrovert and you know I had lots of excuses of (laughs) why I shouldn't be the one to do this. Um, But I know, at least, you know, we see that a lot in the Bible too. Even with Moses, he called Moses to (laughs) free the people of Israel. And God even argued, or Moses even argued a little bit with God and said, I'm not qualified to do this. Um, But so, yeah. I chose to listen and trust what God said and ended up going for it. And I actually was fully prepared for it to fail. I was like, you know what? Okay, I will listen and try it. And if in a year it's not going that great, I have no regrets and I could shut it down. (laughs) Um, But really it's gone the complete opposite. And I think that just bears witness to when God does put something on our hearts. He usually almost always has a plan for it to be generative, you know, not isolated. It's not just about you, you know, and it's to expand his kingdom and expand our communities and our partnership with him in that. And so that's really what has happened. And the podcast has taken me, it's given me so many new relationships all over the world. And I think the first email I got from a listener was from South Africa. Mm-hmm. After a couple of months, I got this email from a visual artist in South Africa who said, thank you so much. There's not a lot of resources for me as a Christian being in the arts world. And I just couldn't believe it. Like I'm, in my little basement, (laughs) you know, doing my podcast and editing, and then it was reaching South Africa. So yeah, it was just a huge opening, just of my perspective too. that how big God is when we give him our little yes, you know. (laughs) That's so beautiful. That's really beautiful. And as I'm hearing you articulate, there's something that for me, it resonates as I continue to mature in my own faith and really understand that verse that really articulates for us, you know, the trust in God and that how he works everything together for the good. And sometimes we just can get pretty narrow to think, you know, that's about me. And Mm -hmm. 
that's such a small perspective because it's never that. It's never about God doing something just for me. It always has ramifications of bringing him honor and glory and to feed out, to dripple out, you know, in some way. Um, to yeah. So that's a beautiful reminder that um, although we might feel intimidated or uncertain or, you know, under-equipped, that he really knows what he's doing and that small yes can turn out to be something big that reaches globally so i just i appreciate your yes and i know there are countless individuals that have been so blessed by your yes and i think that that's an encouragement for us all to really attend to listening and know that god wants to speak and to move and to do that thing that seems exceedingly abundantly beyond so it's so beautiful so thank you yeah yeah <clears throat> And I have to say, too, it's given me the opportunity to have these one-on-one conversations in, like, you know, just a concentrated amount of time, like 45 minutes. I'm talking one-on-one with somebody and hearing their stories, and then I'm curating them with how I edit the episode. And I've realized, you know, part of this vocation is curating conversations and curating this space of listening and just how valuable that is and even when I hang up with somebody it just feels like something sacred just happened you know <laughs> it's been crafting as you're articulating that like choreography where mm-hmm. you might have a lot of information and material and options that can be put together to create a work and it is a curation, curation in, you know, so many words that yeah. is that way to concisely be specific about what am I going to choose and throw away like the editing floor, right. Of creating films the way that used to be done. Splice. Yeah. There's heaps on the floor. Um, so I, I think that that's really beautiful. And I, and I have to say um, and admit for me, Selfishly, that's something that I've been enjoying as well during this series this year of connecting with friends. It's such a privilege and it reminds me, oh yeah, I love these people. And to Mm -hmm. have moments of being able to connect one-on-one and know that later on others are going to be invited into it, but it's now and it's, we're present. And I'm so, so very thankful for that as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So as we're looking at this idea of you being cultivated into a leader, a leader, and I know you speak to many different types of leaders that are out there, um, as you've been able to determine for yourself leadership skills that you feel are important for you to develop, what are ones that you feel like you would encourage and inspire others to c- cultivate in their own um, Know, attempts to oversee and manage whatever it is that God has entrusted to them, leadership skills to develop. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I definitely would share a couple of things on that. And one, when I was thinking about it is you can't lead others to a place that you've never been to yourself. And I know we're in this culture of influence and followers and platform and opportunity (laughs) and it just can get really overwhelming and you know people wanting to build that but wanting to skip that growing stage you know of going through some of these things themselves and so that would be a really big one that I would share is to be willing to sit in that space with God, just you and God growing, you know, kind of like that year of prayer I had at my piano, you know, and not to be seeking opportunity before the growth, you know, and before you even have the character development and spiritual development to hold those opportunities, you know, and, um, So that's kind of a big one. When I was in worship ministry, leading worship more, um, that was a big one too. Like you had to have your own time in worship with God and that personal time before you could lead others into it. Um, That should just be an overflow of what is already 
happened in your life. And, you know, our creative work should be evidence of what God has been doing one-on-one with us, you know? And so that's a really big one um, for me. And when I even just discipling students through dance and in the classroom, that's a big one. I tell them is you've got to do the training because you can't, you know, (laughs) ever expect, you know, to get further and, you know, in leadership and continuing on if you're not willing to go here yourself. So that's a big one. And then another one I really believe is important is um, to always be teachable yourself and to never be afraid to be a beginner, Um, which my life's a good example of that. (laughs) Um, You know, for those things that God does speak to you and place on your heart and places to go. And if you say yes, it might mean you're a beginner or it might mean it looks like you're a beginner and, you know, new at something, but to always never be afraid of that because I just see over and over, that's how God likes to start things, you know? (laughs) Um, And I'm sure. He likes to be the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He likes to be the teacher. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, just to be okay with that and be teachable yourself. And even as a choreographer or whatever your art medium is to continue to push, you know, what is new for you to try new things, you know, not always stay in that safe place that might you feel like makes you look good, but maybe just to try some new things and it's going to be experimental and might not look great. (laughs) Um, But I just think that's so important, especially for young people to see leaders do, you know, and inspire young people to not get so caught up in influence and having to be good at something right away, but to be willing to work in that that's really what creative creativity is, is trying something new, exploring that space, responding to the new. Yeah, Yeah, that's so wonderful. As you're speaking, it's making me think about just in that process of how we can learn things and our attempts of practicing our art and cultivating the skills in our art. That means we're going through um, stages of becoming more um, accomplished and mm. becoming more um, prolific in our either articulation or cultivation in our artistry. And so that does mean there's times when it's not all magnificent, everything that we do and everything we create and everything we produce. And I just went to this idea of how either our forefathers or foremothers in the scriptures that have done amazing things or how God is known for a many multitude of things that have been done in creation or in the lives of humanity or formulating history. Um, some of those are pretty magnificent, but some of those times are pretty quiet and intimate and small and mm-hmm. that's not to... I don't know, begrudgingly um, discount those things that may seem um, pretty minor in our art creation, that that might be the very thing that somebody has to hear or the only way they're going to grasp um, whatever truth it is that God is relaying. So I'm just thinking all kinds of when you talk that all of those stages are important in that humility and how we approach um, and being teachable, it's, it's so very important. Yeah. 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 And you really, you really see through scriptures, how God always works with the small and the hiddenness, mm-hmm. you know, even just talking about Christmas this past month and remembering how God showed the shepherds, a couple of shepherds, like <laughs> this magnificent news 
and he kept it, you know, hidden and just a couple of people. And that's just like always how he works throughout scripture. And it's so hard for us to keep value on that. Yeah. And it is hard in particular in this day and age, and you alluded to, you know, technology and, you know, even social media and the sensationalism, uh, if it doesn't have this magnificent splash of appeal, then it's often devalued. And mm -hmm. so it's so contrary. I, and I agree how God can move in that very intimate, private, sweet, tender, quiet place that we can discount because we're already ready for the bigger thing and yeah. it doesn't get any bigger or more significant or profound than that sweet intimacy and small quote unquote start. Um, so that's a lovely reminder. Yeah. Really beautiful. Yeah. Well, I love too how dance is just naturally conducive to being teachable because we have to embody surrender. Like, you know, in the studio, in choreography, like you have to embody surrender during improv. You know, there's just so much give and take because our physical bodies are involved and like it demands us to respect its limitations and respond to them. And, and so you have to be teachable, you know, as a dancer, it's just part of the art form, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of it being so in the moment and alive. And now that mm -hmm. we're responding to it, how are we interacting with it? And it's not just this output and teaching in the university setting. It's often about, you know, my final grade and my final project, but the process yeah. of my 56, soon 57 years of life, I'm sure learning more about the preciousness of the process, that that's where so much of the value comes. And so I'm also hearing you articulate that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so as we're looking at the world and looking at the arts and God moving in and through the arts and just even in the condition of our world today, how are you seeing God move in your sphere of influence or just you spoke about, you know, having global connections. Just what do you feel like God's doing these days in particular related to how the arts or the artists can um, be in tandem with what he's doing or um, just ways that the arts are being involved in the world today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's definitely a loaded question. Um, <laughs> but I love it. So it's, this is what I love talking about. Um, so, I mean, I'm seeing such really amazing things happening, you know, with an awakening of creativity, like I've never seen before. Um, and maybe you can testify to that too, you know, even with dance and Christians in the professional dance community, I just feel like we're seeing these little explosions of communities and dance training companies and all these things popping up when I feel like it was really hard to find in my teen years when I was like, who does this? You know, <laughs> there weren't too many, but um, just <clears throat> love how I'm seeing that rise up and become a real influence in the dance world and um, visual artists, you know, I'm just seeing such an awakening of just that connection to God through their art form. Um, but I, I do still see a gap, I feel like, in the church, capital C, you know, generalizing here, but I still see a gap and feel a gap that I don't feel like churches have caught up yet or even know how to. Um, and I don't know, I used to always use the language like restore the arts to the church, and I don't use that language anymore because it I feel like artists they're doing it already and it's the churches <laughs> are having a hard time figuring out like how do they cultivate space for artists to be who they are and to be an influential voice in congregations without strings attached um, so I'm definitely still seeing a gap there and I'm it's a slow work and a slow change because I think 
church leadership needs to think more creatively. Like it doesn't look the same to support an artist anymore, you know? And I always have lots of ideas on this. I'm like one of those visionaries. <laughs> Like, I have no idea how this would work, but wouldn't it be cool, you know, if we had a space downtown and the church maybe helped fund it, but let the artists run it. And because those are the spaces people are coming to, you know, and they're looking for spiritual connection. They're going to museums and they're going to, you know, these little community gathering spaces that concerts are happening happening you know house concerts these small venues people are craving intimate connection and they're seeking it through creative the creative realm and so i think you know i would still love to see the church start connecting with that more mm -hmm. um and i'm sure it's i'm happy to see it's definitely happening you know which is great to see but so I'm just really seeing an amazing rise and awakening definitely God and how he's connecting us globally too yes. you know I don't think I ever had any concept of that growing up like I didn't feel like influential you know <laughs> or how I ever could be that just was impossible to me and I can look at like with the podcast, it's the easiest way to measure and see things, but I can look at like different countries, downloads have happened and it just blows my mind. Like there's one from Turkey, that's a Muslim country, you know, and like <laughs> there's one in Iran and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> I don't know what God's doing, but something, you know, so it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, let's, and it is global. And he says so clearly in the word for us to go into the world. And however it is that we go through our art, through dance, through this medium of being able to have access to the internet and interviews in our arts and how many, um, just the accessibility of dance that people can look on Vimeo or YouTube. Or, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm enormous and I agree with you that um, in my you know nearly 40 years of journeying in faith as well as in as an artist seeing this transformation happen and the creativity isn't going away the passion for creativity isn't going away it's just yeah how is it being dis disseminated and where mm -hmm. are the arenas um, and people I believe like you are wanting to be more in authentic experiences and spaces and that there is a realness there and a vulnerability and transparency from the artist that's needed to um, create those environments mm -hmm. yeah i mean i love the internet and the way it can connect us but i think we're like kind of reaching this limit you know as humanity <laughs> as a population of like we are craving that, you know, real, authentic human interaction because so much of it has been replaced by internet connection, you know? And there's more studies being done now too, just, and we, this would be hours of conversation about the ramifications of that and mental mm -hmm. health, emotional health. I mean, it, it just is the decline that we're on because of the lack of humanity connection and the mm -hmm. uh, ways we're trying to get our uh, value. Yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> I know. Me included. Like it's, it's tough. Yeah. I agree. Absolutely. Well, as we're starting to come to a close, I just would love to hear if there's other areas that we didn't touch on uh, other words of inspiration, encouragement, um, wisdom that you would like to share. Yeah. You know, I just would really encourage people kind of encompassing everything we've talked about, but, you know, to really take some risks and give your small yes to the Lord when he speaks it. And it doesn't mean you have to know exactly what it's all 
going to entail or what it's going to look like. And it doesn't mean you have to be an expert. Your yes doesn't mean you're an expert, <laughs> um, which there can just be so much freedom in that. And, you know, so much like generative, it can, um, yeah, just continue on and be an overflow when you say one yes, it usually leads to another yes. And that's just been something I've been discovering the last several years. And um, when I, I was 39, when I was starting to look into recording some of my songs, and I was on the verge of turning 40. And I was actually, I think I was reading through the Bible that year. And just was in a space that I felt like, you know, really hearing and listening what God was leading me to do. And wasn't super excited about turning 40, but <laughs> I heard God say, these are going to be your most fruitful and abundant years. Um, and I'm watching that unfold, but it's unfolded with small yeses, mm -hmm. you know, and I certainly have my share of fears and inadequacies. <laughs> um, that list is long, but yeah, I'm just finding out like the fruitfulness and freedom is behind those small yeses. And he's an adventurous God, he, you know, <laughs> yeah. and we have to remember that, you know, there's joy and adventure behind a lot of his things he's asking us to do. Yeah. Wow. That's good. When I think, um, again, about that, yes, for me, what comes into mind is the, the sense of I'll say yes. And then the control takes over. Yes. However, um, I don't want to be out of my comfort zone or I don't want to have to trust you too much <laughs> Yeah. or what it is that I'm saying yes to. So I'll say yes, but can you lay it all out? And boy, that doesn't involve much faith. And it sure can rob creativity when we choose to, you know, proceed that way with our own yes. And so what I'm hearing you say is how important it is to say yes and really say yes with open hands and know that he will bring then you to an opportunity for another yes. So as we prove faithful in smaller things, other things will come along. And so, yeah, I'm inspired today and encouraged today. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's a no, and that can bring freedom too. you know, God is asking you to say no to something, which that can be almost scarier, you know, <laughs> um, if you feel like you're limiting your opportunities, if you say no to something that looks really good, you know, um, and I feel like, I don't know if you do a word for the year, but I know a lot of people do, and I wasn't even looking for a word for the year, but like God burned it on my brain a few weeks ago <laughs> and gave me the word focus, which I really need more of. We were talking about this distractedness and just been convicted about that, you know, and how much more invasive that's become in my life and the evolution of that over the last few years. Um, but to focus also means saying no to some things you know, and I know he's asking me to kind of streamline and focus, you know, on these things he's already given me and wants to continue to cultivate. And sometimes that can feel scary too, you know, like I'm limiting myself. Yeah. But, yeah. And that can be the challenge for artists, right? That we don't want to mm -hmm. feel limitations at times, or we don't want to, you know, pass up that these could be also possibilities that could be a part of my toolbox of creativity to allow me to do what it is that I'm feeling led and creatively stimulated to accomplish. Um, yeah, but sometimes that narrowing really allows there to be so much creativity, allows so many mm -hmm. more possibilities that we ne may never have thought of. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's a scarcity mindset to think focusing will limit us, you know, that we have to just remember there's abundance in everything God asks us to do. And he will, you know, multiply our loaves and fishes and it's okay to focus. 
Yes, good word to start the year. Focus is important, I'm sure all of us, I know I need that as well. And usually at this time of year, we tend to jump in on a New Year's resolution and get a feeling of a fresh start. And so I just encourage us all to really take this word as well and to know that God can do amazing things as we focus our vision on him and allow him to continue to lead and guide and direct us where he will with every one of our yeses. Yeah, definitely. Libby, thank you so much for your time. And I'll make sure that I um, tag on a way that people can connect in with you um, through websites or through the work that you're doing with Art and Faith and the connections there. Um, but I admire you, appreciate you, respect you, and just thank you for your investment. And I know that there's so much more yet to come in your future with the way God's leading you and with all of your yeses. Yeah, well, thank you, Cynthia. Thanks for creating this space here. You're welcome. Thank you.